Wars Salam. Tonight we have the honor of having an eminent professor, scholar, and a scientist as our guest to talk for Puya. As you know, Puya stands for Professional Organization of Iranian Americans in Atlanta. Puya is an affiliate of Kanun, which is a non-political, non-religious, and a purely independent organization. I have the honor to be the president of Puya, which has a board of directors different from that of Khan. The lectures are in English so that Iranians, uh, Iranian Americans uh, who are of generation 1.5 and 2, who unfortunately do not know Farsi, can benefit from it. Puya works tirelessly to uphold the three pillars of its mission. Number one, to provide an opportunity for Iranian American professionals to network and support each other. Number two, to help the next generation of Iranian American professionals to succeed and prosper. Number three, to promote a positive image and counter the negative media depiction of Iran and Iranian professionals. Please support Puya by donating via puya.net or puya.com. Um, now I will introduce our learned scholar, Professor Kambize Purezai. Dr. Kambize Purezai received his engineering degree from Tehran University and his PhD from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York in 1982. Since then, he has been teaching at Drexel University He's currently a professor at the School of Biomedical Engineering. Dr. Purezai's current uh, uh, research and teaching involve developing medical devices. In the past, Professor Purezai had worked in the area of bio and nanotechnology. Dr. Purezai has been engaged in developing two commercial medical devices, one of which has received FDA approval. In addition, Dr. Purezai has presented at several conferences in Iran and collaborated with academics in Iran in the area of medical devices. Dr. Purezai, it's an honor for, for Puya and Conan to have you as a speaker, and uh, we are all you know, eager to, to listen to your lecture. So we are all ears. Would you please, you know, start? Thank you, Dr. Varzigar, and I want to say hello to all uh, people who attended, all friends, and I hope uh, you have a, you will have a useful hour. Uh, so let me start uh, by sharing screen. And <clears throat> okay. Uh, that's my information. I will make also my slides available to uh, uh, Kanun so that uh, if you have question about any part of what I talk, uh, you are interested. This this talk is should be of interest to those who are are interested to develop any product, and in particular medical device product. But many of what I talk uh, tonight is general processes now adopt as co considered as best practices uh, in the US. Uh, that's an outline of my talk. I define a medical device. Medical devices are a regulated product like airplane cars. There are many other products that are not regulated. So uh, that regulation uh, would add another layer of um, consideration when you want to uh, develop a medical device. We talk about user needs, which is very important concept in any uh, uh, medical, de any device or product development. First, you want to know if anybody is interested in what you are doing, because in, as engineers, we typically get excited about an idea, we develop it, then we find out uh, uh, we we cannot find people who would be interested to use it. 
we talk about system engineering in particular, we, uh, in the courses I coordinate or teach, we talk about safety engineering. What, how do we design a product to be safe? That's uh, the key aspect. Um, then we talk about safety acceptance criteria. One of the uh, very important concepts are risk management. Uh, it's very important. And uh, I have introduced a very uh, prominent uh, Iranian who is a, a very important person in the area of risk management, has written a book. And I hope he will come and talk at Puya about risk management. We talk about the standards, extremely important concepts, uh, which without having standards, following the standards, no industry, real industry can exist. Then we talk about human factors, which more and more becoming important in product development. And in this area, many people uh, go into this area with psychology background. Two groups of people work in this particular area of human factors. Either people uh, from psych psychology background or from industrial engineering. These are, and this area is be growing bigger and bigger. The best example of a successful product with great human factors are iPhone. It's maybe the gold standard of what a good uh, human factor is. Uh, okay, uh, I wanna put a disclaimer. Many of the slides I'm using, I coordinate and teach several courses. And in these courses, I bring people from industry and uh, government agencies. So I have borrowed the slide from them. What is the definition of a medical device? This is a definition by uh, FDA. So. Uh, basically is used for diagnostic or treatment or uh, prevention, but it should not use uh, chemicals or chemistry because that's part of the FDA that regulates drugs. This here we are talking about devices. So FDA has uh, basically three branches. One controls drug, which is the largest one and the oldest one. And then there is the one that devices and recently tobacco has been added to that. So if it doesn't deal with metabolism and chemical reaction, uh, then uh, it's considered a medical device. And this is a hypothetical medical device. Um, when you go for your annual checkup, they may uh, connect a EKG electrode to you, then behind the, the computer that takes uh, that data from the probes, there is all kind of signal processing that would get rid of the noise. And then most of these devices somehow connected to the outlet electricity. So uh, we have to be concerned about that too. In fact, if you go to um, hospitals, you see, you see the outlets are slightly different in terms of look than uh, regular outlets. Anything we use in a medical device should be medical grade. So an, a regular transformer that may cost $10, if it's a medical grade, it would cost more. It has to be much more uh, reliable, also safer. Uh, this is a life, it's 10 phase of life uh, cycle of a, the, any product development. You have an idea, then you come up with a concept, then you plan, then you write down requirements, very important. Then you go to paper and pencil or CAD system, computer aided system, and you design something. Then you try to uh, build it. Uh, then you, you build something, you test it to go back to see if it meets the requirement that you wrote then you implement it, then you go to market, so on and, and so forth. So these are a uh, different cycle of, uh, th this is one model, by the way, called 10 phase cycle of. Uh, here, what we see is uh, 
from system engineering point of view. F first, you create what is called user requirements. That means whoever is going to use this device, uh, what does that end user would like the device to do? So if I'm developing a particular device, let, let's say for a dentist, I would sit down and talk to that dentist and would say, well, I want to make uh, something that uh, does A, B, C, D, but more or less may give me a wish list. And as an engineer, I try to take that wish list, turn it into some kind of design or engineering language. Then, uh, then I design something and I share that with the end user, see if the user, after I sketch it or something would like it, sometime I have to make a prototype. And many uh, systems are made out of modules. So I make different module, test each module, then integrate them and then test the system. So this is more or less a roadmap. Uh, part of what I talk and part of what is happening in developing products in US in training people is they're trying to, people have places like FDA, NIST, other places, they have looked at best practices and they try to com come up with a roadmap. Say so this, these are if you these are ideas that are good ideas. I don't want anybody to look at this, say this is mandatory or it has to be always this way. But these are sort of give you an idea of best practices. Uh, this is a book um, by called Biodesign. Uh, the last author, Y O C K is main, main author, is it? Concept developed at Stanford over many years, and they look at many successful companies, in particular those coming out of Stanford in this area of medical devices. And they have written a very thick book and goes through all the steps. And also they, they have a program, uh, you can get a master degree and uh, very hard to get in, uh, but uh, many of the people who go there are already have MDs, but they are interested in developing. And this biodesign now has more or less become um, the main uh, process and all the US major companies more or less follows it. And there are crash courses. You can take crash courses on biodesign. And uh, so I try to summarize it. And what you, the picture you see is a pacemaker, I believe. So the, they focus, the, the biodesign from Stanford focuses a whole lot in the early part. Say before even a company should get engaged in developing uh, any device, uh, or if you are an entrepreneur and you want to, uh, come up with a new device, spend a lot of time early part to get as much input from the user. See what the market needs and or go to the places. The best places obviously to go would be uh, to go to hospitals. And so many of the people who participate in program like biodesign at the Stanford or other places may spend three to six months in the hospital, go from one department to the other and they gather ideas and they work typically in a team and through some kind of sifting and filtering they would come up uh, with the product that they want to focus on now uh, this picture shows it's first you try to find the need that's probably the most important part by the way the early part is the least expensive part because more or less if you're an entrepreneur is your time. And if, as you go through the life cycle of product development, things get more and more expensive. You make a prototype, it costs money. You wanna change that prototype, it costs even more money. So the more you spend early on upfront, you save time uh, at the end. So, you identify a need that's extremely important because uh, you, you don't want to develop a product then look for customer. First, you want to know if you develop it, there's already a need for it. There are people who, if you make it, uh, they would use it. 
so invent and <clears throat> so it's a lot of uh, emphasis on early. This is a very interesting picture that captured the concept. Basically, what this uh, picture says: look at many needs. Don't look at look at maybe hundred. Let, let's say us needs that are, are there, then based on some criteria that uh, you, you may consider your own expertise, how much money does it cost, uh, or something you may be passionate about, choose, reduce it to a limited number of needs. Then for each, let's say you reduce it to three needs. Then for each of these needs, come up with several concepts of how you may address that need. Also, they want you not to focus on a solution right away. That's a typical error by old engineers that you start with a solution and you get um, sort of married to that solution and uh, very hard to depart from. So what they practice in the biodesign is don't get hooked into any need upfront, get too excited. Also, don't only look at a particular solution. Don't focus on the solution right away. Look at various concepts, evaluate them. And then at the end, uh, the output is the, the product you're going to develop. This in uh, summary was what the bio design uh, would say. Basically, you want uh, to identify the need. And there are many books written about voice of customers. Uh, how to interview experts, for example, right now, National Science Foundation and also National Institute of Health has a program called iCorp, based on many of the idea of biosensors. And they, uh, it's given to people who have small uh, grant from NIH or NSF to develop product. And part of that, they train you and they require that you talk at least to 100 experts in that field. And that's where you get the user inputs, very important. Uh, and also they teach you how to listen to the users. When you go and interview a user, you should not go with, with a solution. The whole idea is going and learning and not talking about solution, you talk at, you think and talk about solution all the way at the end, as opposed in front. It's, these are very important lessons, not only for product development. I think for many aspects of life, I find it it's very important. Listening, uh, very important. Uh, identifying the needs, trying to address it, not making quick judgment, coming up with solution uh, quickly. Uh, Dr. Barziger, how much time did I spend so far? I can't hear you. Yeah, you have you have time. Don't worry. Uh, cost of medical de medical devices may cost depending on how complicated they are. Ten to two hundred million. A lot of time. Now, the other problem with developing medical devices from business point of view is the upfront cost is a whole lot. You, it costs a lot of money uh, to get FDA approval. So let's say it may cost one or $2 million to make do the engineering part. It may cost another $10 million of lawyer's fee. More than, people who make a lot of money in this business are lawyers. So they, they are the one that would take your result, go, uh, they are specialized in dealing with FDA, uh, minimum, uh, they charge five to six hundred dollars an hour. The top one, uh, thousand or two thousand dollars an hour, is not on on her. And and to get an FDA approval, depending on complexity. So if you look at it from a business point of view, it's not a good business, by the way, to invest in. I I personally would not invest my own money in medical devices. Um, because the risk is high and upfront, you have to spend a lot of money. Now, if I spend $10 million, uh, then uh, now I have, to, the company has to make $100 million because one out of 10 companies become successful, right? So it's a, 
very difficult uh, field and uh, to, uh, to be, especially for entrepreneur. If you are good yourself and have work in the industry and do it in your garage and so on and so forth, that may save you the money on the engineering side. But still, if you want to go uh, get FDA, by the way, FDA approval depends on what class your device is, we will talk. For some devices, it may not be as uh, difficult as others. So that would be part of the decision-making. So I may say, well, I, this, I, this is, there is great needs for such a thing, but it's a class three device and it costs a lot of money. So I may not chase it. So that's one of the criteria you would use whether to pursue a certain need or not. Uh, is it easy to get FDA approval for that particular need or not? Uh, so we talk about uh, needs finding. Uh, you ask the customer, it's emphasize a whole lot. I think in everything else, we should uh, find out who the customer is or stakeholders are uh, and listen to them. Uh, concept generation. This is a, also another interesting concept that being emphasized. It's very good outside product development. You want, you want to get together and do brainstorming. One of the good uh, rule for good brainstorming is don't be judgmental. If somebody says something, don't attack them. Don't uh, say this is a bad idea or what a stupid idea. Don't be judgmental. Let people think outside the box. I mean, the idea may sound initially, uh, if, uh, if they would have, told somebody about I, some of the iPhone ideas, <laughs> I, I, I think uh, people would thought is a bad idea. So you, it's good not to be judgmental in the brainstorming, respect other people's uh, ideas. And, and also part of the, a good brainstorming is to focus. Don't get off, off tangent. Don't, uh, uh, and keep do uh, documenting. You keep writing down as people suggest ideas. Mm -hmm. So these are the processes which are not that expensive. You should do ahead of time uh, before you spend a lot of money and time on developing the product. So these concepts are captured here. You look at potential effect of what you do and health. How much time does it require to get to result? Does it take five years, two years? Because if it's five years, then you have to pay engineers and all the people. How much resources required? Do you have access to those resources? That's one thing nice about universities or companies that are within incubator new universities is that they can access at a reasonable cost to resources within universities. And both NSF, NIH, other government agencies give money to universities, especially to support the small businesses. So and as a small business, you can go and use facilities at a reasonable price uh, within universities. Uh, you have to cultivate customers. Uh, then you have to do market analysis. Uh, there are courses almost these days every university offer on entrepreneurship and there are many, almost every university offer now minor, minor in entrepreneurship. Let's say you are taking a course in degree in engineering, you may want to also get a minor in entrepreneurship if you are interested to develop. I think if there is, there is no other country as good as US if you are an entrepreneur. Uh, this is, I think US is the best place for somebody who has an idea or wants to develop new product. It's much easier, there are more resources available than anywhere else. <clears throat> uh, this is a very interesting chart. If you're developing a product, uh, you this is based on uh, year 2020. Uh, what, 23 years old? So you see at 2020, most of the spending was on anything related to heart. Uh, then you see how it goes, these things have changed. So if you develop anything for heart, you know that it's a big market, right? You don't wanna develop 
product in an area which is uh, relatively small. Uh, there are some diseases that very small group of people have it, sometimes NIH or other agencies. Government give money for companies to develop devices or treatment called orphan, uh, orphan drugs or orphan devices. Writing is very important. Uh, avoid solution, focus on goals, get a specific change. Change menu means if you do all the analysis and you see uh, the chances of um, moving forward is not good, see if you can pivot and go to other areas. This is a list of companies that either the, basically the research came uh, out of my lab and or my student, my colleague, uh, three companies, I show you their product. Uh, this is a FNIR device. This is the research for brain imaging. It's not an FDA approved because it's just for research. Um, let's see. Uh, and here you see uh, the gentleman put a band, like a bandana on his head and that, uses a uh, light to probe uh, the brain, basically monitor ox change of oxyhemoglobin versus deoxyhemoglobin. Similar technologies used here, this device is FDA approved, uh, is um, monitors shallow hematoma due to brain injury. Most of the support for this particular device came from military and military is because of all the accident for soldiers. Um, so far this company have received probably six or $7 million and it's still uh, in, in its infancy after 10, 15 years. Um, this is another company, uh, Barati Medical, Dr. Barati is my former PhD student. These are uh, similar technology, similar platform using optics, here we are developing uh, the same uh, imaging for uh, animals. Animals are used in many uh, development for, for, for example, for drug development. So one area we have recently focused is uh, the area of anesthesio anesthesiology. Now, uh, I want to show you example of uh, uh, product development. Uh, one is waterfall model uh, here. So again, uh, on the top, uh, you identify needs and intended use. Intended use actually is a legal term used by FDA. Because if I make a, let's say, uh, knife for surgery, its intended use is for that particular case. Or I may uh, design something for a particular purpose. The doctors can use that device for other purposes. The doc, FDA cannot tell the, FDA, uh, the doctors what to do, but the company is not liable if the doctor use it for non-intended use. So, all the same with medication. That um, ultimately, medicine is practiced by the doctors, but uh, but in terms of liability, companies say, "Okay, we made this particular device for this application. If you use it for other purposes, you are at uh, your own uh, risk." Now, what you see is a waterfall model that, from uh, needs, are expressed by users in qualitative language. Typically you talk to nurses, they're the best source of identifying needs or doctors. Then as an engineer or biomedical engineer, you turn that into engineering language, you call it requirement. Then from the requirement, which is the input to the system, you come up with some output. You do paper and pencil design, you come up, then eventually, if it's a hardware, you make a prototype and then test it. And it, this process may go through several iterations. You 
you review the design even before you make it and eventually you test it. It's very important that you, you sometimes you develop a new idea and you have to also come up with new test mechanism because there is no testing procedure for that. For devices which are more traditional, there are tests, standard tests available that you can use. Here we have verification, but basically verification would say you, from engineering point of view, you made a device that meets the requirements that, that you set for it. Validation means, okay, this is a good device from engineering point of view, but does it do the job that is the medical part of it? So validation is when you test it on animals or you test it clinical testing. And that in itself uh, becomes serious. Once you go from verification to validation, the costs go quite high. For I'll give you an example, one of the products I show you, which was hematoma, at the same time, for the same patient, we had to also uh, get CT scan. So we compare our result against gold standard for hematoma, which was CT scan. And we, we had to pay the, the hospital for the doctor, for each patient, for the CT scan and everything. And now, uh, let's say you test 100 subjects and five, or five of them has hematoma. And let's say for a statistical purposes, FDA requires that you have 100 subjects that have hematoma. Now, 5% of your subjects had hematoma and if you 100, now suddenly you have to do 1,000 or several, thousand subjects that's and each of them if it costs let's say a couple of thousand dollars uh, for the doctors the ct scan everything you see how rapidly this clinical trial uh, can become uh, then also uh, they require that you test on different population people who have darker skin versus lighter skin people male female a lot of emphasis you have to have balance between number of male and female, for example, uh, age group. Uh, so you have, so these things make the devices expensive. So even though the device from electronic point of view may have hundred dollar worth of parts, but you have already spent the 10, $15 million to develop it. So you are not going to sell it for hundred dollars. So you have to sell that device and let's say you sell 10,000 of that device. So you have to sell it at a price that covers your expenses plus some uh, factor because you took a risk on developing this device. This is another model is called a uh, <clears throat> spiral model that rather than going step by step, you, you go, you do a little bit of something, you test it, then you do a little bit more and you keep adding more. There are all kinds of models for product development. Now let's talk about safety because uh, the focus of what we teach, we, the courses I teach, we, uh, typically we don't focus too much on engineering. We assume that in your engineering courses like electronic or biomechanics, you have learned the engineering aspect of what you need to do. We typically focus on these other issues, for example, safety. What is safety? Say, these are possible definition of safety. Safety is freedom from harm. Safety is freedom from possibility of harm. Safety is freedom from unacceptable risk. That is the, def the definition that is a standard ISO 14971 and accepted by FDA. Believe it or not, when a definition like this come out, so many different people who write these standard gather and argue about commas and I'm an observer in one of these standard committees is unbelievable. People at very high level sit down over so many hours to write these standards. But without these standards, there would be no industrial work. It's really all about the standard and meeting those are stuff. By the way, ISO Inter International Standard Organization. 
definition are important, harm, hazard. Hazard is potential source of harm, like the out, electrical outlet in your room. It's not necessarily harm, but it can be, kid can put an, don't do it. Risk is probability of loss or injury from a hazard. Freedom from unacceptable, safety is freedom from unacceptable risk. Anything you do medical, there is some risk. So you cannot uh, avoid some risk, but the question that uh, FDA tries to debate with the manufacturer is, is the risk versus the benefit of that procedure or device, uh, if, if the risk can be mi as minimized, number one, has the manufacturer done every effort to minimize it? And at the end, is it acceptable? And uh, versus the benefit it has. Then also, we should talk about quality. I will get to that in a minute. For example, this is a laser pointer uh, that they come in different color. I mean, this is most professors use laser pointers like this, but you're not supposed to look at it. And they have usually um, some labeling on them. Uh, so this is a situation that it can be hazard, uh, but it will cause harm if you uh, not use it for its intended use. You, you should not directly look into this device. Uh, this is the definition of safety and effectiveness. By the way, up to 1970s, there were hardly much regulation about medical devices in US. It's surprising. But as technology became more prevalent in medicine and more and more medical devices become available like pacemaker, all kinds of technologies and things went bad, there were pressure on the Congress and eventually Congress started passing law and regulating medical devices. <clears throat> and uh, I think the first act was in somewhere in the 70s. And slowly uh, there were more regulation. Initially, well, the FDA was uh, mainly focused about safety. Now, not only they are focusing on safety, they are also effectiveness. How, I mean, not only it's safe, does it do what it claim it do? It does. In Europe, a European have a different system. They're focusing on mainly safety because the ultimate buyer in Europe is government because they have national health. They say, if it's not effective, the buyer would not buy it. But in US, you have to show both safety and effectiveness. Uh, I have uh, used the red color for assurance because that's a very interesting legal term that used in uh, by FDA. Assurance is sort of say, you know, uh, we have, considered everything we can and it looks good, all right? It's sort of you trust that it's assuring you. It's no guarantee, right? But it's sort of assuring you. Uh, and when you go to FDA, you wanna prove that this is safe. You, you have to use valid scientific evidence, right? And that's very important. Testing is very important. Testing as a field is very important. Uh, and in fact, a few years ago, I was approached by Army to develop a master program for testing. There is a place called Aberdeen, uh, which is about an hour from uh, Philadelphia. That's where Army proving ground is in Aberdeen. It's between Philadelphia and <clears throat> DC, and they test everything Army makes. Tanks, bullets, and they have unbelievable, it's a very fascinating place. And they hire a lot of our students. I used to do some consulting for them and they asked me, because they couldn't hire people who were good with testing. They wanted the Drexel offers a master degree in testing. And I think still, if any school is smart enough, every industry would grab them. People who uh, design new tests. Mm -hmm. Efficacy is that 
basically it does uh, what it's supposed to do. If there is this equivalent device in, in uh, the market to get a, a FDA approval is not that easy. You have to show that you're safe, at least as good as what is in the market. In Europe is different. In Europe uh, from European Union, they give CEs equivalent to FDA approval and they are more concerned with uh, safety. Therefore, many US companies, first they go to Europe and they get CE approval. They create cash flow. And also they gain experience if there are bugs in the system, they fix it. They collect a lot of data, then they come and get, uh, for example, the product I show you for Hematoma, our company, we had CE approval in Europe for several years before we were able to get FDA approval. Uh, in, this is an, a standard which is uh, used uh, IEC 6601. Th these numbers you can type and it tells you, it talks about using something for normal condition, uh, single fault condition, single fault, if you have a device or product which is doing something sensitive, and let's say it uses some kind of sensors, for things which are critical, you want to have more than one sensor or more than one way to protect against something bad happening. For example, uh, the Boeing that uh, had recently uh, had several accidents. It was designed for two ways to protect it against crash. And those uh, method of protection, I'm summarizing it and putting it in simple language. Uh, with each of them would, was a second version was additional, let's say $2 million. So many countries like Ethiopian airline, when they bought it, they bought with the minimum option. So they didn't have all the necessary protection that, that. so a redundancy is very important in things like which are uh, mission sensitive. By the way, the, mo the oldest uh, industry that has been regulated and they are extremely good at it is airline industry. NASA and airline, many of the concept of safety, risk management, uh, idea of product development, came from uh, airline industry and many of the people, once the uh, Congress passed a law to regulate uh, devices, uh, many people that at FDA were hired, they came from uh, airline industry, from NASA or from nuclear industry. Nuclear industries, these are industries that are highly regulated. Therefore, safety is prime and you have to have many redundancies. So normal condition is, let's say I buy a lawnmower, right? I buy a lawnmower and it's electric lawnmower and it says, don't use it when it's raining, right? So that's defined, that's normal condition or intended use. So now if it's raining and I, uh, or it's very wet and I go and, uh, mow the lawn, so I have used the product outside of what it was uh, supposed to do. So then the company would claim that they are not liable if you get uh, electric shock or uh, some electric failure. Uh, here, see, when we look at the safety and effectiveness, they're basically what you see, I don't want to spend too much time on detail of here. We have to look at it from engineering point of view, also from medical point of view. That's what is unique about medical device. You cannot only evaluate it from engineering perspective. You also have to evaluate it. I may make a device that works very well, but might be uh, difficult for a surgeon to hold it, right? Or uh, it may interfere with the workflow, like in an operating room, there is a workflow. Uh, surgeon or trained, it's just things work like, like this. You, you, you don't wanna interrupt the workflow. 
So I better move a little bit faster. Safety of the device. Uh, basically, <clears throat> devices are in three categories. Class one, the simplest. Class two, a little bit more risky, more complicated. Class three uh, are like pacemakers and other, and you have to do a lot. Here, I, I'm showing you, I, I just played game. I used chat GPT and I just put a question, FDA classification of medical devices. And that's, these are the answers that uh, chat GPT created example includes bandage, that's class one. Uh, glow, so class one, very low risk. Class two includes wheelchair infusion pump. Infusion pumps is the one in the hospital, they give you food and drug. Class three is artificial hardware. <clears throat> Why, what, I mean, I'm using more and more chat GPT versus I used to be attached to Google search, is that you start a conversation in chat GPT, you say, uh, tell me uh, how I can get reimbursement. I did this this morning. Reimbursement for a medical device from my insurance company or a doctor can get reimbursement for using a medical device. It gave a bunch of uh, things. Then I said, well, do I need a code? What makes it chat is because you start asking the chat GPT a question and within that thread of conversation, you can ask, get deeper in, based on the, the response you hear, you know that you may ask a deeper question. They're very powerful and uh, God knows to come up with this uh, answer, how many document chat GPT reviewed. I was, was just, I thought it would be fun to do that. Exa these are standards for safety, uh, some of them for, uh, machinery, some for road vehicle, for lease. There is absolutely um, standards for everything. Now I wanna uh, bring to your attention uh, this, uh, the, you know, I, you remember I talk about quality because uh, ISO standards are there to make sure that uh, we have, our product has, good quality. Now, we, we use this in our classes and we ask the student, which device, which car do you think is high quality? And uh, those are people who are my age, they remember these VWs and they don't have a car and they don't have radiator. They have um, basically air cool. In some sense, they were good cars for the money, right? Now, the other car is a Corvette. It's an expensive car, but it serves a different purpose. Um, then you have that Toyota Corolla. It's a good car for transportation. So quality, in a sense, is in the eye of beholder, right? It, for that particular purpose. But that's the definition of quality based on... <clears throat> this uh, ISO 9000. ISO 9000 is the mother of all the standards. It's a quality management study. And basically says to degree to which a set of inherent characteristics of a product fulfills requirement of customers and interested parties. So if I promise it that it does A, B, C, D, and to what degree it really does A, B, C, right? Well, that's the definition of quality. Now, risk management. Risk management is a extremely important, and I hope we are would bring Dr. Elahi, who is an expert in risk management. He has written the key book. In this case, this uh, the this is a racing motorcycle. It's a very risky activity, but if you look, both the manufacturer of this a race motorcycle and the racer have taken a lot of uh, precautionary measures like helmet, like knee pad. The motorcycle has all kinds of uh, <coughs> uh, risk protection. 
but nevertheless, uh, it's a risky activity. But the, the person who <laughs> is going to race in a uh, motor uh, right, in a bicycle, uh, uh, not bicycle, motorcycle racing has accepted the risk, but has done the best he and the manufacturer could do to minimize the risk. Uh, risk management, you learn from uh, similar product, uh, you learn from similar technologies, because when you're making a new product and you make, you have to make risk assessment and minimize your risk, and this FDA requires when you go to get uh, FDA approval, FDA will say, show me your uh, risk assessment of the device. And it's a tedious thing they do. It's a very serious business. So you have to assign risk. And sometimes this you have to use similar products or similar technologies or talk to experienced engineers and clinicians uh, to come up uh, with the risk of something and decide whether it's worth doing it or not, or how to manage it. So this is another risky activity, rock climbing. But if you look, these people to the extent possible have tried to manage the risk by using the rope, by using the right uh, tools. Now, I don't think this is a, this is an example of not quite the risk is managed. And if you notice there is a welding machine there and the welder is welding very near the gas tank. No? And this is, this is a uh, example of where the risk, in some sense, one may argue within the resources this person has, he also has tried to manage the risk. And I leave that to your judgment. This is the Bible of uh, risk management by FDA. And every so often these, uh, these standards are documents you can go on FDA site and find it. And this, is, this in itself is a business. The people who do risk assessment is a very, in itself is a branch of um, important branch in product development. Uh, you have, as a company, you have to identify foreseeable hazard causes. Uh, you have to have way of avoiding it. At some point, you may not be able to completely get rid of the risk. Then you use labels and uh, these are classes. Uh, now I just wanna take five more minutes. Uh, an area which is becoming more and more uh, important for any product development is especially medical or non-medical is human factors. <clears throat> Human factors, uh, a lot of uh, industrial engineers do then also people with psychology background. And many psychology uh, programs now offer special uh, training in this area, human factors. And basically, uh, when you develop a product, it's you as the designer, are responsible to imagine errors that the user may make. So you cannot say, oh, okay, I made this device and I wrote a manual, the user should go and read the manual. That is not, <laughs> that would not save you in a court. If somebody come and say, oh, you put this button in the wrong place by mistake, the nurse pushed it and the patient died, and these things happen. I say, well, uh, this was a bad place to put that button. And it, the chance of that error was high. And they bring consultant, they bring top-notch consultants and the consultant would come into the court and would say, oh, 
no, this is a poor design. That consultant would show five or six different ways that that button could have been put in different location and this error would not happen. So more and more become the designer responsibility to imagine what called use errors and try to avoid it. And there are people who are being trained in that. Then there are also ways. Uh, at some point I was developing a cup, we called it a smart cup. And the idea of cup was to use by elderly people who may have uh, hard to remember or may have even dementia and they have to take certain proteins, liquid proteins. Uh, but the cup was called a smart cup and would monitor how much the subject drank and, and inform the patient or record it and send it to Bluetooth to caregiver. Now, so we put a lot of effort, we designed the device, then we put the liquid in it, and then we went and tried it on some subject of the same age, right? And we noticed, oh, it was too heavy for them. So we didn't have to make a functional device to test that idea. So you can test that idea of how much weight those subjects can handle without even making a functional thing. So as a designer, you are responsible uh, to imagine things that can go wrong. And that's part of a good hands on. And FDA requires now <coughs> that you have done human factor design. And the people who are trained uh, in this area are highly in demand. For example, if you, you put too many uh, devices in an operating room and nurse get confused. So there is a lot of push to integrate uh, these devices. And now um, you have to use labeling, packaging. These are all part of uh, human factors. The owner manual is a part of um, how you label the package is. Um, so, the shape of uh, something is it. These are all the standards that go to the user manual. So in this slide capture it, uh, for safety, you try to design something for safety. So you try to minimize problem in the design. If you did everything and you couldn't uh, minimize it or get rid of it, then you have to put a label. That's called protective measures. Then you try to also inform the user that for example, you are going to, we are going to use F MRI and it may make noise and you know, it may cause problem A or B. But uh, you try as much as possible to address safety and, and all the other problem early on as part of the design. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for listening and um, um, thank you. And I'm open if you have questions. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it, of course. Uh